you guys just keep hitting. He's the coach to some of the greatest players in golf. Justin Rose, Hunter Mahan, Lee Westwood, and the world number one, Tiger Woods. Sean Foley's come a long way in just a few short years. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Golf Talk Live. I'm Sean Foley. Teaching at a public course in Ontario. Hey, just trust what you feel. What's made him so successful? What's his approach to the game? And why is it so controversial? Let's find out with our guest this week, Sean Foley. Okay, so a good Canadian kid. It could have been hockey. could have been curling, football. But it's golf. Yes. Why golf? Well, I, my, my father is from Glasgow and my mom's from the West Indies, so hockey was probably out. Uh, <laughs> um, it could have been soccer, for sure. But I don't know what it was about the... Uh, I was never a very good team player. Um, I kind of liked the onus on myself. And my father took me to the range in San Francisco when I was 10. And uh, I, I remember it vividly. And, and that was kind of it. That was, that was really the genesis of even led to me to where I'm at. Now you were, you know, you were a pretty good player, but at some point you decided it's not going to be playing, it's going to be coaching. Yeah, I, I was, I'd say I was a really good practicer. <laughs> I wouldn't say I was a very, you know, a very good player. I mean, I, I was very good for 14 holes, but I'd have four disasters out there. Um, the last four? Or it could have been any it could it, it could have been. Normally, if, if the wind was off the left and there was trouble on the right, that was pretty much, I might as well just wrote seven on the card before I played the hole. So <laughs> that was my own thing. But, you know, I was always fascinated at trying to hit the perfect shot. And even going to the Canadian Open where, you know, my favorite players would be out on the golf course, I would just sit patiently and wait for them on the range. So I remember going to Glen Abbey a number of times, and I couldn't even tell you which hole was which hole because I would just sit on the range. Um, that was and kind of it. So you were watching them about uh, like how they struck the ball or you know, how they prepared? Or what, what was, it the, yeah, what was, it was the fascination about the range? I think the fascina fascination was just at a young age was just watching the ball in the air and the sound um, and kind of the precision and the power. What is it about the difference between them and a really good you know, club player? And there's some really good club players sure. who you know, are zero handicap. Yeah. But there's a difference. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? The great amateurs, they typically play the same golf course, and that's where they're a plus three handicap. These guys can go week to week to new golf courses and shoot kind of the same scores. So it's their understanding of how to manage what's happening, too. I've seen a lot of guys out there look like they're shooting 80 and shoot 69, whereas I've seen a lot of great club players turn 68 into 77. So the way, they, the way they manage what they're doing um, is, is fascinating. So you take, I did this thing with junior golfers where they were all scratch handicaps. But in their tournaments, they were five handicaps. So people said, oh, they need to see a sports psych. It's mental. I said, no, they just don't understand how to break a course down. The first time the kids played it was in the tournament. Whereas the pros are there two days before. Their caddies walked it three times. They know the runouts to certain angles. So they... They manage, they manage it. They very rarely are hitting it into places where they know that even as good as they are, that they don't have much of a shot. How much of it is here? I mean, there's obviously the, the mechanical aspect of golf mm. is, is critical. Mm. Uh, but you're a big believer in, uh, in what's going on in your head. Sure. Too. Yeah, I just think that, you know, it's, it's, it, if you have conflict... In, in your life, there's no way you're gonna go walk around for five hours and, 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 and deal with it. I remember a, a, a while ago that the guy was like, you know, what's happened to this player? You know, his, his left arm used to be here, but now it's here, and that's why he's dropped 200 in the world ranking. I'm like, well, you know, his, you know, his dad also died of leukemia seven months ago, and he's so sad he can't even handle it. I said, maybe that's it. Maybe it's not 10 degrees of shift in his left arm. Maybe it's the fact that he goes on the golf course and sees his dad where he used to stand there and used to stand there and cries himself to sleep every night that his mentor and best friend is gone. Maybe it's that. So that, that to me is... How do you deal with that, though? You, like, you, can you deal with it? It's just time. I don't think you can, I don't think you can analyze it or, or try and get rid of it. I think being real about it and being vulnerable with it is the best way to overcome it. The problem is, is that socially we're taught as men is to not be weak 
and to be strong and to and unfortunately we're just not being honest so we keep running from the same thing we keep running into and each time we run into it with more force to the point that it's just all consuming why is this game so difficult you know you're hitting a little white ball right with basically a stick in your hand sure and a swing <laughs> it sounds simple it's, I, not. it's almost that's the, almost the answer on why it's so difficult right i mean yeah. you've got you've got a flat surface with varying loft hitting a round object so for example if you take a guy like gary woodland who swings at 124 miles an hour if he was to deliver the club face and then the movement of the club face the path of it like dead with the target line both at zero so it should create a dead straight shot but if he's hit the ball a dimple Okay, so a millimeter left of the center of the club face. I mean, you're looking at probably anywhere from 17 to 21 yards right. So someone like Gary Woodland, if he makes 10 great swings, he's really only mathematically going to hit five fairways. So that, that's what people don't understand. When you look at the depth of the science and the, the way that I've, that, I've, that I've went with the help of People who don't even play golf, they're just geometrists or physicists. What they do on the PGA Tour on the weekend when they're playing well, those guys will say is not probable. And I think that's that inner, that inner genius, is that they look at it and go, there's no way someone can do that. So it, what makes it so difficult is that, you know, that is really the, the, the case. And then what also makes it difficult is, is the fear. Um, so you know, that fear is going to release cortisol and norepinephrine into the system, which is then going to change grip pressures and timing, and people are speeding up their walk, then their rhythm's speeding up. And it's amazing that we would have fear at playing golf. But and, it, and amazing that it's when you put yourself in position yeah. by having played well yeah. that the fear starts. Yeah, and I think what happens is that, you know, like as human beings, we feel our thinking. But your thoughts are arbitrary and nonsensical and they're not really real. It's like a dream. It's not real. You, know, you could wake up in the morning and be worried about your kids because you had this nightmare. But it's just, it's just a bunch of, of thinking happening in this state. So it, it's not real. So the thing is to understand and under, recognize that your thinking is not really true. So if you're over a putt and you start thinking of three putting it, it doesn't mean anything at all. It just means it's just an arbitrary random thought. It doesn't mean you're going to three putt. So I think that it does when I do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you can let it you can let it manifest. But I, I think you know I was talking to uh, the media. Hunter shot a uh, 62 one time, and he shot 70 the next day. And they said, why can't these guys follow up a 62 yeah. with a 64? And I said, well, the 62 is a complete outlier. It's almost an anomaly. I said, if you take Hunter's last a thousand rounds, he's average shooting 70. So no, on Friday he didn't go out and choke. He just went out and shot what he always shoots. So it, it's, it's recognizing the difficult, difficulty and then trying to understand almost money ball golf into probability. So from, I'll ask you, from a 150 yards, number one on tour in proximity to the hole from the fairway, from 150 yards, how close is it? Eight feet. It's 25 feet, right? Really? From 220 yards, what is it, do you think, from the fairway? 40 feet. Yeah, 46. And you only say 40 because... Because you said 20. So I've... <laughs> from right? 50. Right. And <laughs> so I've said to a lot of kids that, you know, part of the reason that you struggle is because you don't understand that from 100, 120 yards, Luke Donald's number one on tour at 17 or 18 feet, and you hit it to 20 feet and tell me that you waste so many opportunities from this distance where I'm telling you that's world class. So how do you ever expect to build confidence when the bar that you set for yourself is, is completely, it's not approachable. When we come back, what it's like to coach Tiger Woods. What would surprise me about him? If you were to hang out with him for the day? Yeah. Probably everything. More with Canadian Sean Foley right after this.
Sean Foley following the ball in the air. Oh, what a shot. And he likes it. And he should. Justin Rose could have a chance to end this one when we come back. You teach some of the, or teach is probably the wrong word, what is it, coach, some of the uh, best players in the world. You know, everybody knows about the Tiger. Justin Rose, Lee Westwood, Hunter Mayhem. They all, when you watch them, they all swing differently, right? Mm. So there is no sort of perfect swing, right? There's mm. no yeah. sort of ideal swing. No. But how does it work for you? I mean, you're teaching or you're coaching four very different players mm. with very different techniques. So is there a different kind of coaching with each one? Yeah, I mean, it's also four different learning styles and, and then four different personality styles. And then the dynamics of their personality is all different. If I'm working with Justin Rose and, and, and you would put a boom mic on us, you would think we're figuring out the theory of relativity. But that's just how no one thinks more than him. But it doesn't hurt him. Whereas, whereas Hunter needs to have images and feelings. And, and that's... And like what? what, are you, what are you? Well, for example, like, you know, I like when Hunter's... This is the mechanical part. Yeah. On a mid-iron, I like when Hunter's attack angle. So the angle of descent is about 4.5 degrees. The direction the sweet spot moving at impact is one degree left of the target line. All right, and the launch is such and such. The spin rate is 6,200. And that's what I want from him. I want it to be about 104 feet off the ground. And because Hunter went to Oklahoma State um, and they're orange, I tell him, I want, this is a paintbrush in the right hand, so I want you to paint an inclined circle around you and then paint a straight line down to the target. And that gives me the numbers on my radar that I want. But he's, that's where he's at. So when people are like, oh, it's so mechanical, Justin Rose made a great comment one time when they asked him after the U.S. Open. He said, Sean has helped me a lot with my mechanics, but at the same point, not having me get technical. So even though the perception of me is that I'm this technician, scientist, what have you, my own players are saying, no, I'm not getting more technical. But, you know, people believe what they want to believe and see what they want to see. So it, it is very different, but they all have their own thumbprint. When you're standing uh, watching Hunter Mahan on the, on the uh, range, can you tell how close he is to all those numbers you just listed? About uh, ball height, about angle of attack, like, can you tell that? It, it's c close. I mean, that's why I use a radar and, and a track man. So I'm never, like, you'll see me out on the range and I've got that there and I've got my video camera. I won't refer one number to those guys unless they ask, and they will, they don't even know I'm shooting them on video. I don't want them to come back and look at it, right? It's just so that if I'm asked a question, I'm measuring rather than guessing. And even the camera is not a very good idea as a function of measuring, because if I change the position of the camera by a half an inch, the plane's going to look different because of the parallax and the lens. So it's, when I have that track man, it looks like we're back there and we're doing calculus. But it's just so I know. It sounds like it too. Yeah, but it's just so I, mean, it I know. It sounds so technical. Yeah, totally. But it's, it's just so, it's so I know that if I'm asked a question, I'm not, because look, it's, to improve them this much takes years and could be the difference between 86th and third in the world. But you could screw them up this much in three weeks. So it's, my main goal is to not hurt them. We haven't talked about Tiger Woods. What is the, what is the understanding of that relationship? I mean, it, are, do you feel free to talk about working with Tiger Woods? Is there an issue there, or, or does, does he not want you to talk? No, I mean, I, 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 I don't typically talk about what I'm working on with any of my players. Right. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, you know, Tiger Woods, that was kind of the, that was kind of the, the ultimate dream. Um, just out of, I mean, I, I don't know if there was a bigger fan. But that must be tough to be the fan and work with them and say, you know, we, we got to. Yeah, I think, I, I think that that's, I think that's just business. Like, it is a business. And so that's just, uh, I, I look, I'm fans of all my guys. And I'm fans of so many guys that I don't even coach. And. 
and I just think with Tiger that you know he he to me if you it, I don't care about records he's the greatest player who's ever played the game so to be a golf geek you know like me um, to be able to stand behind him and watch and watch what he does and how he goes about doing it and then to see how he's done it in just this complex situation that he's in um, it's just fascinating what would surprise me about him as one of those who's you know never met him watches him reads about him what would surprise me if you were to hang out with him for the day yeah probably everything with the ability to have all the enablement and entitlement that could be seen by a person like that um, just really how down to earth and how much of just a like fan of golf that he is I mean historically you can ask him a question about who won the PGA Championship in 1921 and it's unbelievably never gets it wrong I don't even but know what did he know that the only gold medal winner in golf came from this course he might Toronto? not he, he might not know it came from this course but I can guarantee you that he would know who George S Lyons was okay um, yeah he's a ve very much a student of the game he would know all about George Knudsen do you um, ever pinch yourself about where you are who you're walking down the fairway with on the, the Tuesday or the Wednesday when you're uh, able to do that with the with the players I mean you're the guy who what eight ten years ago you were working at the keg at night and Mm -hmm. doing everything from uh, teaching uh, eight or nine year olds to mm. probably picking balls up off the range sure yeah I mean I, I mean, don't that's pretty fast to go from A to B yeah I, I, I guess you know I, I, I guess it is but I, I feel like my A to B I'm 39 now and if that's my B I think my A was like literally the first time my dad took me to that range in San Francisco it was like you know, with, with Einstein, and the analogy isn't of brilliance, but when he learned that one plus one equaled two, that was it. Like, he was on the way to, every day was, was on its way to relati the theory of relati relativity. So, I mean, I have had those moments. Yeah, there's, 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 no, there's no doubt I, I've had those, those moments. I think there was an, 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 almost a, an expectation that it would happen within myself. Like, I just believed that... It, look, if, if my heroes like Mandela and Dr. King, what they did, if it was possible for them to do that, then I should imagine that really anything is possible, um, you know, for myself. But in the back of my mind is having that image of, of where I want to be 10 years from now and seeing myself there often. Um, where is that? Where is the 10 years from now today? Uh, I don't know if I'll be coaching anymore 10 years from now. I don't want at my funeral anyone to come up to my kids and tell them what a great golf coach I was. I, I want them to almost forget at that point that I actually did that. So I just want to, to, to help people, um, you know, to, to help people understand themselves, understand the way that they think and why they think that way, um, and then to try to help kids who, who just who have no chance. I guess that's why I shouldn't be surprised um, that the golf coach in you still is able to, you know, quote Einstein or Buffett or talk about Dr. King or all mm. the others. Mm. Um, you're not talking about past golfers or coaches. Mm -mm. You're talking about people who, in fact, did change the world, mm. have changed the world. Mm. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's like Gandhi said, right? You need to be the change you want to see in the world. I see so much value in that. You know, like, I've been, I've struggled and I've been broke and I was still, like, pretty much enjoying life even in those circumstances. And then I've done well. I've kind of pretty much lived my dreams to this point, but it's still not enough. It's not the, you know, uh, uh, a big check or my players winning a big tournament, it doesn't do a lot for me. You know, it's, it's just that's part of my job. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy for them. Like when Justin Rose won the U.S. Open um, and, and, you know, he kissed his finger and he pointed to the sky. That to me was the coolest thing that I've ever seen for Justin. So I was 99% happy for Justin and 1%. I've already had my moments. Now, if I take a, a young girl who I start with her at 12, and she gets into the final of the USAM, I watch my guys in the major and my heart rate doesn't even change. 
but I watch my girls or the young kids I've worked with who are about to reach what they envision, and I'm like, need to throw up in a bag. <laughs> so I've, 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 fully de- I've fully helped their development, whereas every player I work with on tour and every coach who works with a player on tour uh, who didn't start with them as kids, they're already developed. Still ahead, the ups and downs of taking a philosophical approach to the fairway. It, it's almost like a, what they ripped me for. Like, you're just a golf pro, just be a golf pro. Right? Final thoughts with Canada's Sean Foley right after this. Did any of your uh, top players ever come up to you and say, look, Sean, enough with the Gandhi stuff. I just want to feel what, like, what's happening to my nine iron and my backswing? Yeah, you know what? I, 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 like, I always study nonverbals in people, and, and I can kind of recognize, you know, if one of my players comes to the range and he's like, man, my hotel room is terrible, the people next door are so loud, um, God, the traffic on the way here, I'm not even going to talk to them because they're not ready to listen to anything. You know, whereas I wait for my moments, and, and maybe my downside is that I do get a little too preachy, but I can kind of observe myself, and I can observe. I know when they're listening and when they're not. So it, I don't, that could be the perception of me. So if you read articles, that's what you'll think. And it's kind of funny to be like, to be a man of the world and envision enlightenment for the world is almost like a, what they rip me for. Like, you're just a golf pro. Just be a golf pro. Right? It's just what I do for a living. It's, this is not, it doesn't define me. So um, I kind of know the ones that want to hear that and that are interested in that versus the ones who just want to hit it straighter and, and, and further. So um, I'm careful with that. But I use it a lot with kids. This has been fascinating. Great conversation. Yeah, thanks. It, it's been uh, awesome to be here. I feel like my handicap's gone down three or four <laughs> strokes just talking to you. Well, I don't, I, I don't know, but I wish I had that effect. Yeah, that'd be a great, that'd be a great thing. <laughs> thanks, Ron. Thank you.